I'm not sure how you are feeling about this. If you've seen someone in a suit from uh, and has done a press conference and has done, said something strange, one of my first reactions was, hmm, well, is this real or is this someone from the Peng Collective? Because the Peng Collective has done a lot of cool activities throughout the last couple of years about police violence, tracking, uh, rescue at sea. So please welcome them to the stage. Our speakers are Connie Ranner and Ronnie Sommer. They are from the Peng Collective and they are talking about Media Guerrilla. And yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming and also everyone who helped out. It's one of the most beautiful indoor festivals in there is for all the neurodivergent opportunities there are and everyone who helped out with the Peng activities. There were a lot of people out uh, there and we're working on these and without you this would not be possible. So please a round of applause for everyone else, not only the two of us who are sitting here. Okay. We have been thinking about how do we introduce ourselves. So we just wanted to talk about some problems we've seen. So let's just read them out. We have a bag full of problems. It's the uh, Global South and the disadvantagement of the Global South. It's weapon exports. It's Nazis in the parliament. It's the raising uh, of... Oh, God, it's so much. It's the criminalization of rescue at sea and so on. So it's a lot of problems and within the next hour we want to well not bring a solution but at least uh, some idea how we can react to them or we want to talk about how we are dealing with these problems it's kind of difficult to describe what we are doing it's maybe tactical media work or the FD is saying is that I have a lot of understanding for a lot of things, but you are advertising the Criminal Pen Collective. So I just want to start with the first activity. So Germany goes to shoplift. And we also will skip over a couple of our activities. So this one, we see the problem that we as consumers, the people who are just going through their everyday life, we have this mindset how much our food and uh, our clothes are dependent on exploitation of the global south. And we just have the mindset, well, we are not able to do anything about it. So maybe there is a law about this, so th we are not no longer able to sell goods which are based on exploitation, but then there are groups that are fighting against these laws. So around two years ago, we did this activity, Germany goes to shoplift, and let's go to the website where we wanted to have opportunities to fair trade uh, goods and not fair trade goods. So we also wanted to give the opportunity to shoplift and then directly pay the people producing those goods. So let's, for example, say um, I want some flowers. First you pay directly to the people who are producing it and then you go to the shop and shoplift there and here you can order stuff, you can order a couple of coffees, flowers and then you can just pay for it. And we directly paid this to the unions in the global south, this money we raised here. So here we have a clip. 
You love cheap prices. Say thank you to the enslaved children who harvest the coffee beans so you can buy cheap chocolate and coffee. Thanks to the plant workers uh, in Brasilia who uh, don't have legal rights, you can get this bag of oranges for 50 cents. Hey, what's up? That's not fair. Shoplifting. I'm just paying the right people. Sixteen ninety four directly to the producers. This is the website deutschlandgeetclown.de. So this was just developer thinking. It's a workaround where we were thinking, how can we offer a third opportunity? And at the same time, we know that property is a holy thing uh, in Germany. So even though we exploit the third world and um, shopping is a f form of uh, like, like it's criminal, and so the so we wanted to change this around. So if we say we want to sh go shoplifting, that's encouraging a criminal activity. But we are saying we actually what we usually do normally that's actually criminal because it's exploitation. So we want to channel this anger, and that worked out through the, and the media was reporting on it, and we tried to give interviews to people in the global south, and the UN economy, economy expert Jeffrey Sachs was interviewed and confronted with this raccoon, is this a good, is it, like, and asked, is this a good solution? So it was like reaching a very high level. So, and even though a lot of NGOs were saying, no, please, please don't do this. This is not mainstream. But yes, still it worked out and it was debated in the ministry and they were giving it a priority. We were expecting high, uh, like, um, ha having to pay high prices for this, but we had a very good lawyer, and she was able to give very good arguments, so the um, court case was just dropped in the end, and we didn't have to pay for it. The criminal left people. Uh, 26 was a great hack, Ronnie. Oh, wait, we have a signature move, we, and we have to be entertaining now. And after ever, every uh, talk, we do a signature move. Oh, great hack. Okay, Article 26. The next thing uh, we did is on German arms exports and the industry behind that. That was 2017. We had a cooperation with uh, the theater in Dortmund. What we did was um, bring up uh, the subject of German arms export into three parts. We have politics, we have uh, the trade, and we have the industry who manufacture these weapons. And for every one of these three parts, we developed an action, which we have combined into one campaign, to, which we called Article 26, because in uh, our constitution, we have this Article 26, who says Germany may not export arms, but there are a couple of loopholes, so we wind up doing that. The first one of these actions was about uh, politics, and the legal um, situation is very clear. There is one party very aligned with uh, the arms lobby, this is the CSU, the one party uh, that calls itself 
Christian. And we wanted to point out this contradiction. So we did the following thing. Hello, my name is Brigitte Ebersbach and I'm the chairwoman of the CDU local uh, team. I have been uh, talking with our, the citizens of our, peop, of our nice uh, city and in the church since the refugee crisis. We are being confronted with the consequences of violence and war every day here in our nice city. But who uh, brings forth all this misery into our world? We are a part of this. Germany is the third largest uh, exporter of arms in the world. So our country is engaged in the vicious circle of violence and death. Especially the so-called small arms claim lots of lives every year. Experts estimate that 90% of all uh, Fatalities in wars are caused, caused by these small weapons. As a convinced CDU politician, mother of two children, and as a devout Christian, I cannot stand for this any longer. Dear Chancellor Merkel, you have faith in the basics of uh, human community during the refugee crisis. You have uh, made your name as a Christian chancellor in all world. Article 26 of our constitution, uh, Germany supports peace. So we ask you to continue to support these principles and this ethics and to fight in the next legislative period for a ban on export of small weapons. Your Christian basis uh, asks you to have empathy for a CDU with empathy. We also ask you, the audience, go online, inform yourselves, sign our petition, CDU. We have empathy. CDU has empathy, our very, very nice uh, video. We uploaded that in May 2017, and shortly later there was this, uh, these news on Fox News and in the New York Times and on the Vatican's radio. And all together, 100 news stations around the world reported on this. This went like this. We had produced this video, we had a campaign site, we founded a special CDU uh, local council for this, we hired this actress from uh, the Theatre Dortmund, who you've seen there, the devout Christian. We had a petition on change.org, which was signed by uh, putatively, totally genuine CDU voters. And we had a press release, and eventually a journalist called us and asked, are you really the Christian basis of the CDU? And we said, of course we are. So the news went out. Uh, we were so fair to reveal later that was was not the CDU, unfortunately. This was Peng, this was us. But it's very interesting that it was newsworthy all over the world that the Christian Democratic Party stands for Christian values. Uh, a tint for um, all the backbenchers in the CDU. If you want to go to the news, want to be in the news, stand for Christian values. So there were three actions. This was the first one in politics. The second one was about the arms traders. We picked Heckler and Koch. You presumably know that. They mostly produce salt weapons here in Germany, and they export a lot to the US of A. And we thought, OK, Heckler and Koch, they talk about ethical responsibility, which they claim to shoulder, but really nothing happens. So we, in the name of Heckler and Koch, uh, set up an ethic guidelines manifesto, and we researched 
shops in the US who sell these shops. So we have a list of these shops in the USA and we wrote them letters in the name of Heckler and Koch. We said, we're very sorry, but since Donald Trump is president, uh, the US are unfortunately not a safe state to export to, so we're recalling all our weapons. And please resend, send them back to us. This is Heckler and Koch uh, painting them as the victims, crying a lot, that these criminals from Peng produced fake news boohoo. It's just take this in, Heckler and Koch claiming to be the victims. And this was up on their site for about a week. And then there's the third action of this campaign. This was the most resource-intense um, event of this. This was... Uh, this is a very small circle and it's very hard to get into. It's very hard to get there. So we thought, okay, if we can't go to them, then let's make them come to us. So we... Um, gave rise to the first pri prize for security and peace um, and reward the engagement for peace in the German arms industry. So we had a lot of cash going spare at that time. So we rented a luxury hotel in Berlin, 6,000 euros per day. Well, we got the money uh, from the cultural foundation of the German state, incidentally. So... We pulled out all the stops, it was very fancy, there was champagne, we had a piano, and we had one arms trader. Uh, we kind of lost uh, oversight and fucked it up a little bit, and we told one company the other one had already uh, RSVP'd. But then word got out, and it was the domino effect. Everybody but two cancelled, and then one of these two was sick or stuck in traffic. So this was the lone arms trader who got there, and this is what happens. Now, uh, giving out the Peace Prize, I'm very excited. We're still preparing here and setting everything up, rehearsing the piano. <laughs> so, it's starting. So, come on, come with me. He's a senior vice president for politics and strategy, and they have a lot of cash flow every year. They pay one million in lobbying fees in Brussels. And of course, there's a lot of uh, corruption. They live to Egypt, Greece, Indonesia, Israel, Pakistan, and the to Turkey, South Korea. Esteemed guests, we are gathered here today for a very special occasion. I'm very happy to give out this prize today. The first German French uh, Prize for Peace and Security. 30 minutes later, we all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Article 26 in our Constitution, and I'd say that this is the secret winner, and of course, we, you all know um, how this law goes. So, arms... Um, designed, designated for wars, may only be manufactured with uh, permission of the uh, German state and may only be proliferated and traded with this permission. This German-French prize for security and peace goes to ThyssenKrupp Marine Systems. Congratulations to the company. I can't believe it. He was afraid of us. He won't escape this prize. He could have accepted it right now. 
Now we are going after him to give it to him, but this is not going to stop it, us. We are still of the opinion that this man deserves it more than anybody else. So he ran away, and we were very, very sad about that. This was half a year's work, lots of calls, lots, lots of work, and then he ran away. And we would have been so very happy of an arms trader happily accepting this prize. This was a bit of a fail. Nevertheless, uh, we were in the media a lot about this. There was a lot of reporting about this campaign and a big debate about uh, the German weapons industry and arms exports. And actually, the SPD added this paragraph about uh, working towards a general arms export and they had this in the campaign program. Well, the SPD is the SPD, and that won't really amount to anything. But we were still happy about this. Okay. Okay. And later we got, uh, we went to Rheinmetall as well. Uh, well, there is uh, more on the page to the Article 26 website. Um, for example, um, we rewrote the um, law for times. You can, if you want, take parts of this and reuse it. Oh, nice hack, Connie. Oh, and thanks for the reminder. Okay. I don't know. Maybe you remember the time where we talked about how we want to deal with the AFD and National Socialists. And if we should talk to them and how we should do that and so on and so forth. And that was in time where Beatrix from Storch, um, well, we got some emails from maybe somebody here in the crowd gave them to us where Beatrix from Storch um, explained her media strategy very precise and how she is going to talk about things that the press is actually um, taking it in and publishing it and we bring these things to Spiegel and other media and then they were all like hackers uh, hacked the AFD and so on and but then maybe we should have like pinned it to their rooms so they don't do it but they did everything so but you know the story and so we ask ourselves how to deal with that and in the emails they are also they wrote down how they should meet and where uh, it was in a hotel to discuss the, the principal's program to get into the uh, German Bundestag. And then uh, I went there and I discussed as a clown and I sang happy birthday and then I slipped, unfortunately. Uh, you may have seen this. Very, very important. Before I threw it, I said glub, 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 because only if you say that you belong to the International Patisserie International, the international movement to throw um, pies. We had no um, photographers, so they had to run away to finish the um, clip. So we had no uh, picture of her, but that she posted for us, and it was very nice of her. And the internet was very thankful for that and made memes out of it. And there was the hashtag um, pie movies. And at the next anti um, AFD um, protest, <laughs> the police actually locked down the, con the patisserie. And after every after that, in, on every protest, there were uh, catapults for pies and things like that. And there was a lot of people trying the same things. Uh, for example, on Sarazin or to uh, Sarah Wagenknecht's uh, face as well. And there have also been pies under um, everywhere. And uh, the police was called for that. And <laughs> There was also a, a sign. Um, people talked about like like only one pie throw away from the um, stage and things like that, and that was what the build was making. Yeah, and all that all uh, was very cheap. Um, I can really 
um, recommend you guys doing that if you have uh, people coming to your place that are right wing. And I think that's a really nice form of protest. For example, in French or Belgium, is it very culturally accepted? And with cool, for example, in Germany, it's not quite so. But now, after the pie throw, it is an accepted political uh, means in Germany. Haunted landlords. Okay, next action. Haunted landlords was an action we made for Halloween. We are friends of the pop culture. It was for the meat market, uh, for the um, a rent market. Um, friends of ours have been thrown out. They were pushed under psychological um, distress and they couldn't do anything because they are on the opposite side of power. And it's very rare that there is um, publicity around it and there are loopholes. And we wanted to do something to make these uh, stories visible. And that's why we made this. And so we um, researched some of the um, incidents of that in Germany. We talked to the people, we interviewed them, and out of these interviews, then we resynchronized them with um, artists, and then we used these MP3s, and then we used the bot to call people all around the clock uh, to call the owners of the houses and presented them those statements. And this is the video for it. This autumn, the um, thrownouts come back to um, bring pain to those that brought them to the streets. The return of the thrownouts. Yeah, hello. You did not buy oil and went to um, holidays. Your uh, renters uh, had to freeze for seven weeks in winter. Yes, hello. I hope that maybe you have a consciousness that you used your parents to um, uh, throw us out of our house. Some months later, we found the um, flat on Immobilien Scout. The price was more than doubled. Hello. You have let the house get destroyed, you terrorized us and you wanted to bring us to move out of the house. It went so far then. Okay. Yeah. That was the bot. It called 30, 40 times a day on all of those numbers. We had the private mobile phone numbers and we had landlines and office numbers. And always if one of the numbers got blocked, the bot just used another number. Yeah, at the beginning we had six houses that we researched beforehand. And and during the week of the action, we got six more, and we interviewed them. We um, took in these uh, statements, and then we also started to call with those statements. So this was um, at the end. It were 600 minutes of calling, and very interestingly, nobody of those um, people actually uh, legally tried to get to us and we interpreted it, uh, we blocked that in that way. Okay, we don't um, publicize the numbers or the addresses of the houses, so if they want to come to us, they have to put down their name to openly, publicly say, okay, we did that wrong, and we, uh, for example, removed... Uh, sorry, it, it was about the addresses of the flats that were rented. 
so they so nobody want, wanted to go public to attack us legally. Interestingly, this action uh, came to the arts world, and now we put that action into several um, art galleries in Berlin, for example. This is took a picture took there. We were featured in several um, art with several articles. Um, this, for example, was in Berlin, where the uh, was an interactive. Um, exhibition where the people coming there could call, so it was really good for the art world. <laughs> Do I have to talk about this, or are you talking about this? I think we are both. So, I think that's a good hack, Connie. Good. Thank you, Ronnie. So mask ID, that had a lot of different levels and was kind of complex. So we went through this with a fest in the in a festival. It's a city festival, and uh, the a theater in Hamburg invited us to do something there. And we were thinking, what do we do? So there was a change of law uh, about the ID and ele the electronic ID. So the f federal state and the uh, states and a lot of agencies and police officers and uh, the secret agencies and so on and all of those agencies um, were able to get the personal data from those IDs. They can just uh, get your biometric passport uh, pictures. So de Maizière is responsible for that. So this digital access is for the fulfillment of the jobs of these agencies and doesn't have to be uh, legally allowed specifically by an attorney, but it's just possible to do it. So if someone is searching for a person um, and once it's uh, already established and is distributed through all the databases, it's not reversible. And we find this very shitty. So we want to make this a topic. So maybe you know about this, this group, uh, Citizen K, which they where they try to morph their pic the their faces on each other and tried to make passports with these morphed photos. So the human brain, if you have two similar faces uh, and you morph them into one picture, and the brain is able to recognize a person, even if the person is only half uh, the person in this picture. So we have merge two pictures here um, with a person from us, with a EU commissioner, and we've used this picture to uh, register a passport. It was kind of easy, and the picture in the middle is what we handed in, and uh, there was a comment about her hair looking funny, and that was it. It was very unproblematic. And this passport we used to make sure uh, how, just to be safe, we put it in a gallery, so it's uh, actually work of art. So we listed three artists, the European Union, uh, Germany, and Peng. And then multiple times the police was called. There is activists. They are calling you an artist. And is this? And it was like there is a fake passport. And uh, the police was like, oh, it's in a gallery. It's in an art gallery. No, we don't go there. So we were just congratulated and could go out. So the next day, uh, we put up containers on the streets. And we had this photo box where people could go in. And they were also given uh, some recommendations. And we were talking to them how they are using their phones, whether they use Face ID, where they have their biometrical data stored. So it was uh, like informing them. And uh, we asked them 
what their poli like we tried to find out what the political opinion is also and when they were maybe a little bit more of a left on the left wing spectrum we invited them to the next step and once they've gone through this process of this conversation and then we made a picture and we had uh, uh, pictures of known right wing people and who we think are assholes and we merged those two pictures of these two different people so we had photos where you had a broken biometrical image and get a passport through this. This was our service uh, which we, where we used the Schauspiel Hamburg's money. Uh, this didn't always work out. So in this case, you can see that it's not the best result. If you do a lot of work, the algorithm is, algorithm is sometimes breaking down and it's not working very well anymore. So if here are any of you want to uh, fix this algorithm, please get in contact with us. So the next step was part two. Here, now we've uh, discussed this question in the European media. Uh, we said it was only just a cover action, but we are actually smuggling people. So we are smuggling people to the second room here, please sign this secret uh, agreement. So can we share this with a colleague in Libya uh, and give them a passport with your identity? So the idea was that the image we have produced, ours, uh, an image about uh, people just drowning in the Mediterranean, and also the, confronted the issue of ourselves having our own passports and wanting to keep them and not breaking the idea of having a nation and being part of that. So what was moving for me, 100% of people who we got into this step just immediately agreed and were like, yes, I'm ready to do that. One maybe irritating question was, can I maybe just give it to a child, which just didn't make any sense because a passport for a child, but everyone we got there was very open to it and very sweet and was like uh, maybe a bit irritated. I've just gifted my identity to someone and and I was just like, I will hand this over to the offices and I have your ID card and your number, so we just put it in a package and send it over. So we wanted to send the passports over to Libya, where we started a Periscope live stream, where we had a live stream of us packaging up the passports. And what you couldn't see uh, was that there was a hole in the package where we were just always using the same passport and again and again. And then on the Periscope stream, we took this package to the post office and pretended to send, or like send it, like, no, we actually sent out this package to Libya and we had a tracker in this package. And uh, the tracker was sending data through, uh, out to a map so we could track it live on its way to Lib Libya. But the package was actually stored with the German post and the package was just left there for three weeks and we just keep kept on waiting and waiting. And we also had an image camera with a SIM card uh, if there was any movement. So we waited and waited for our email, uh, for the tracking, and suddenly the connection was lost and nothing happened anymore. And the package got back to us and our SIM card was destroyed. And the SD card was also destroyed, but so the SIM card wasn't destroyed actually, but taped to the post. So I asked the post and the post was like, no, that's forbidden, that's very strange. And we asked the post office to like give us uh, a written statement and they gave it a written statement. Um, and then nothing else hap happened. 
Um, but like apparently that went to the secret agencies in Germany, so there isn't really a secret of, for post here. Okay, so next action is called Vote Buddy. We did that in 2017, shortly before the German federal election. Oh wait, I still gotta do something. I still wanted to say, three weeks ago, uh, a draft of a law was leaked to heise.de that passport pictures may only be taken um, on site. And so this shows that we have to consider, does it make sense to do this action or do we maybe make politics stuff loopholes that we had exploited before? We can't prove that it's been us or if that had been planned anyway, etc., etc., and we can presume that it probably accelerated the timeline. This law doesn't actually exist yet. You can still bring uh, photoshopped and morphed and changed pictures um, to the authorities. This is not a call to do this, but it's always an ethical consideration in doing these actions. It's not always everything great, but we, of course, have to think through the consequences. It's maybe a very good question for later. Maybe we will have time to talk about that. So maybe we can talk about the pro and contra of exploiting security loopholes um, for campaigns because it points out these loopholes and then they get closed. But now back to vote buddy. German federal elections 2017. We wanted to do something about uh, voting law. We had a number about 9 million adults who must not vote in the elections. This is um, a lot considering we only have 62 million people with rights to vote and it's a very, very high number of people being excluded from the democratic process. We wanted to point out this uh, high number in a humoristic fashion, so we started Vote Buddy. Every four years the same. I didn't know who to vote for, but I felt bad for not going. But it's great that there's Vote Buddy this year. So I don't have to make a decision and do a great thing. Vote Buddy connects people who don't want to vote with people who may not vote. I've been living in Germany for 22 years and in this election, I can vote for the very first time. It's great that it's so easy. Just uh, apply to vote by mail, find your buddy, send them, and you're done. So even my vote counts in the federal election this time. We bring together people who don't want to vote and people who want to vote this election. That's vote buddy. That's the website, that's the video, that's the site. We deliberately made it look like a social entrepreneur bullshit startup. We have the steps, how does it work, find your buddy, uh, vote for a mail-in ballot, meet up, exchange uh, the below. We have testimonials, there's a shop, you can buy t-shirts, bags and potato chips and beer. We have an FAQ. Is this legal or isn't it? Uh, we said, yeah, it's not totally legal. So we had a legal headquarters in New York. And if you have signed up, there's a very simple form. You give your postcode. Are you allowed to vote? You pick a nice icon. And afterwards, after you've signed up, there's an email, a confirmation email. Hi, uh, it's going to take a couple days. We'll find you a buddy. Please wait until we get back to you. And when we had finished building and producing this, we um, did Facebook ads in these right-wing circles and placed it on right-wing blogs. And they built very, very fast. There's a very, very right-wing blog. It's called Penis, the Philosophical Penis. 
or something. And it got 18,000 shares in two days. So the Nazis jumped on it very, very fast. Then here's Erika Steinbach, the Identitary Movement. And this is... Uh, is this the order and this happened? Yeah, it is. Then we have Bernd Lucke from the Alternative for Germany. He thinks that it's a fake and it's very exciting how this spreads. Then, of course, the uh, head of elections in Germany got involved. He didn't find it all that funny. We offered to compromise. Like, okay, maybe we just pass on recommendations but didn't like that either. And then the press started speculating. Who's behind this? Are these right-wing people? Are these left-wing people? Who could have done this? I had a New York phone number that got forwarded to my number. And I only started answering this at 15 o'clock, so New York time, and pretended to sit in my New York office with my startup. And I had a lot of exhausting phone calls with angry Nazis who threatened me with all manner of things. But there were also some funny phone calls among those. For example, with a journalist who's very clever, uh, Lars Wieland, if you're here, hi. He found my LinkedIn biography. I was going by Timo Meissner then. And then he called and asked some questions about Vote Buddy. And then he went, okay, so you worked uh, for the gate set earlier. Who was your boss? Your boss there? Uh, I can't recall that off the top of my head. Okay, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, who was the chairperson at that time. And I was like, let me think on that. And then we both had to start laughing. And it was, of course, clear what's up. Okay. Like, if I had to guess, uh, it's Die Partei, a satirical party, or the Pen Collective. So, um, yeah, may I can neither confirm nor deny I need to get back to my startup. And one day later, we had a very long interview where we resolved this. I gave a long interview to him and we said, okay, the German election law systemically discriminates against people who have lived here for ages but are... Um, may not vote, and this is why we need to reform election law. Um, and then the media reported that this was a fake. But we still have to say something like this, we wouldn't do this anymore, because some of the things we thought would work did not work, because we had what we had hoped would happen was to start um, a discussion on the election law beyond the right-wing bubble, and it didn't carry into the media and the country as a whole. Some people wrote about us, and we just had a handful of articles about the thing we actually wanted to say. But um, it wasn't such a big outcry as uh, we'd hoped for before we resolved it. So we didn't manage to use the attention we had when it was still a fake. We couldn't direct it to the subject we wanted to bring up. And only, not only did we fail at that, we also, and I personally say that, uh, confirmed the weird worldview of many Nazis that the elites uh, manipulate elections, that democracy is broken, etc., etc. So I'm very critical about this uh, action myself. And so this is more or less the last fake action we've done. Because fake news as a method are getting ever more uh, problematic. And here's a nice uh, tweet. We had a mailbox uh, address in New York, but coincidence or not, there's a mosque next door. Okay, we have like 12 minutes. Okay, I hurry. Cop map. The cop map was 2018. We were at a university in Munich um, for art, and we, we like that because we want to ch um, use um, art to manipulate politics. And we worked together with one class that was called police class. They made some um, actions back then, and together with them, we wanted to make. Um, 
action about the police um, law in uh, Bavaria, and it adds a lot of new um, things that the police can do in Bavaria, and it cuts on the human rights. It is about militarization of the police, and so we made this. Oh, okay. And this is based on the idea of the pending danger. Um, uh, so, so the police can get a lot of uh, access and things that they are allowed to do if they say there is a pending danger. And we wanted to change the narrative to, uh, well, the actual um, danger that is um, pending is the police. And for some minorities, it still always was. For example, for black people, for drug users, for poor people, for um, sex workers. For them, the police was always a danger, but with the new law, it is for everybody in the society. And so we thought about what we actually wanted to do, and maybe the real hackers would laugh about it now, but what we thought about was an automatic, automated image recognition to use webcams in flats and then look at the cam uh, at the streets and recognize police cars. And then we realized that the um, effort to train the net networks is really difficult. We tried with uh, toy cars that did not work real well. Uh, we did not have the capacity for it. So we actually would have to go to the real world and get a lot of training data. And that was not what we could handle. So instead, we made a map where people, where we developed a map where people could, um, if you see a person, uh, a, a, a Czech or a police guy, you can add them to the map. So people could look at a map and see where is police activity, and they could evade the police activity there. And what happened then was uh, out of an image book. First, it started with the um, journalists that knew about it. They um, um, so that was uh, okay, and then it went a bit back down, and so we thought, okay, well, maybe that was it, but then this happened. The police um, said it was really horrible, and then the boulevard uh, came in. They normally on the side of the cops, and they were really furious, and they said that our tool was far more dangerous than it actually was because it was really easy to be manipulated. We couldn't check the entries. But they said, okay, these are the police haters and the police haters, they um, alert the um, criminals. This is the build. Burning Morgan Post. This is my favorite. I uh, framed this. <laughs> It's from a totally different action, but I like the, um, they took this picture. And after that, the, poli uh, the politics um, joined the discussion. So they were hoping to um, present themselves, and they said, like, we have to delete this. The um, AFD also wanted to remove it. Christian Lindner uh, made a small inquiry in the Bundestag, and it escalated really if you think about what the tool actually did. <laughs> okay, uh, here, uh, Christian Lindner, he asked uh, 13 questions to the government. The only real interesting question for us was, will the um, Secret Service um, um, spy on us? <laughs> and the answer was, because of uh, the need for secrecy, we can't answer this question. Well, I'd say a no is something different. So, but it didn't stop then. Shortly after was the... Um, the Conference of the Interior Ministers was meeting up and they started discussing how they want to deal with the COP map and we were kind of surprised how quickly that escalated. So you can also see reports on this in Switzerland or in the UK. So it was also in the international press. And here you have a kind of press overview. So what does it actually uh, 
whether any results, because the police law in Bavaria was still passed. Um, but we, what we managed to do is that for a couple of months, a lot of um, the media were reporting on the issue we wanted to bring attention to, and also the boulevard uh, media was just also repeating what we said on our website, and that police violence is a issue, and as I would think this is actually a good result of the actions we did. There were also some cops which agreed to this action, so like this guy, Oliver von Dobrowolski, he was saying, even though he is a cop himself, because he is also seeing issues within the institution of the police. Okay, now a bit fast. Okay. Okay, excuse, there was someone in the audience. So Seebrücke is a group of activists um, in Germany, uh, and this is a port like from the portfolio we showed at the beginning, this is kind of a little bit different. So the situation where the mission lifeline was locked down in the coast and wasn't allowed to go on land in Italy and Seehofer and Merkel were not taking any actions. So we said we make a Seebrücke, we make a connection um, so people are, can go on land self in Europe. So it started a big movement and people were taking on the streets and it was a vehicle to decriminalize rescue at sea. We, I'm saying we, so it's not just Peng on its own, but it's a lot of groups actually taking actions there. There is a telegram channel where I connected a lot of people and a lot of friends were just jumping on. And it was just the right moment because a lot of people were thinking it can't be the case that we just let people drown at sea. And even if they are rescued, then they can actually go on land. So. Uh, the setup was maybe for three months or so, and we uh, built up a web page and a Matrix channel, and we actually launched it through this video. Germany is a beautiful country. It is known for loyalty, respect, and responsibility. Germany is uh, successful and sometimes also for known for humor. Germany was also could rely on friends if they needed help. With our initiative of uh, building a sea bridge uh, with the Interior Ministry, we are sharing this friendship and responsibility for respect for our own people. So we can continue to be who we are, to be, so we can continue to be who we want to be. Germany will take uh, in... So the incredible thing here is that we made this video uh, for as a ministry for um, the interior and so on, and we have still not uh, references because um, then Seehofer was attacked and Google was con contacting us and was like, is this you again? And we were like, we have no idea. And then uh, the attorneys from Google was fighting with uh, the ministry. So we were like happy that Google could fight with the ministry and we were mobilizing. So again, I'm saying we, it's not only us, but a lot of people. There were a couple of burners actually during this time. The incredible thing is, we started with this video, we are mobilizing people for 2000 uh, to take in refugees in 2019, and today we have over 100 local groups. We have 130 so-called safe harbors, which are communities which 
agreed in their local government to take in refugees. In this year alone, there were 3,000 actions taken as this initiative, as Seebrücke. And currently, we are starting an initiative to uh, so Seehofer no longer has to agree to uh, take that the cities can take in refugees because they are saying, yeah, we are willing to, uh, but so far Seehofer has to agree and we want to, with this initiative, say that he no longer has to agree to this. I just want to point out, I myself uh, had to leave this project after three months. So it's uh, not only us, so please get engaged with this project. So this was very strategic because we were saying we have to go to the cities because the federal state of Germany is not actually taking action. Uh, just a brief thing, the critical campaigning manifesto. Is this fake news? Is this real news? What are the rules we have to stick to? Just as a rough guideline. Here's the critical uh, campaigning manifesto inspired by Julian Oliver and the critical engineering manifesto. I've tried to set up 11 or 12 rules which can be used to guide your actions. It's very simple stuff. Don't be repressive, don't repeat that, don't kick down, kick up. Um, it's just come read this. It's not about making sure your organization survives, but rather your goal survives, which many NGOs do wrong. But this is just a quick aside. Okay, just a quick final sentences. We are running out of time, sorry. We've showed this to you to show that you don't need a lot of resources uh, to do great things. Vote Body didn't have a lot of budget, like 200 euros maybe, and we had a lot of reach. We have a great network of experts who supported us, but you can go pretty far if you find a funny hack. And on the subject of hacking, we are very dependent on early access to confidential information. So if anybody uh, in this room wants to support our work, we are very, very happy about any leak about upcoming works access to interesting email accounts, etc., etc., approach us. Also, if you have any ideas on what to do, like build a drone who sprays a Deutsche Bank a tower or something, approach us. We'll happily have you. There's one point left, I think, one very last one, and then we're done. I just wanted to say... One thing, we have a lot of blind spots and it's a bit embarrassing to be here as two white cis-head dudes. Sorry, we're all white in our collective, we're all cis. We don't have many migrant perspectives in this collective. I just want to point this out because we don't know the absolute truth and we wish for a more diversity of perspective in our uh, collective. So if this speaks to you, if this inspires you, Please come talk to us. Thank you.